Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the latest edition of the Jake's Take with Jacob Elishar podcast. I'm your host, Jacob Elishar, chief content producer and writer of jakesake.com, a pop culture entertainment news website. Now, if you're listening to this conversation, please give us on any of our audio platforms, please give us a five star review and also please subscribe. If you're listening to this on you, watching us on YouTube, please give a subscription to the YouTube channel and also like this video, give it a thumbs up and leave your comments below. I'm so excited to welcome my latest guest. He is a Spotify verified artist. He's a singer, songwriter, and producer. So please help me welcome Carlton Stone to the podcast. Ooh. Hey, How are you, Carlton? You're so welcome. How are you? I'm good. We just uh, we played in Austin last night, and then we just finished a, a 10-hour drive. We're in New Mexico now, so... Uh, been a bit of a long day but um this is uh happy to be here and be chatting with you so awesome how's your tour going so far it's great we had um i think last night was our fifth show and uh yeah they've just all been awesome like obviously the crash test dummies they're a legendary canadian band that i was obsessed with when i was growing up so now getting to like play shows with them and be friends with them and you know it's uh it's a bit overwhelming and fun and their audience has been very receptive to uh the new songs i'm playing and and it's just fun to get back out on the road after you know two years of covid basically and get back to like what what i'm good at so <laughs> that's amazing carlton i'm glad that you're enjoying the tour and people are being very receptive that's amazing to hear and like for me if i like if i when I, when I started this back in August 2011, I never thought I would have be followed by some of my favorite people from reality television, like Ethan Son and Rob Sestrino from Survivor, or even know and be friendly with several acts from alumni from America's Got Talent. That means the world, that meant the world to me. Oh my God, you watch Survivor? I'm, I'm a Survivor stan, bro. I've been watching it since the beginning. Awesome. So you'll be happy. So well, after you're done with this conversation, head to jakesashik.com because I got interviews with Rob, with Ethan, with Adam Klein, and with Jay Starrett. Amazing. I'll check that out. No, I love Survivor. I still watch it. I, I didn't know like how many people still do besides me and my family. So That's amazing to hear a call. And also, by the way, um, I did have Paul R. Friedman, who Paul J. Friedman on recently. He's a former CBS vice president of marketing that's actually part of created a campaign for Survivor Borneo. Oh, cool. That's awesome. Yeah, so check that out, interview out because that he has some incredible information about how that first se- how that first season transformed into that Survivor into a powerhouse in reality held. Amazing. I'll I'll definitely check that out. We're not here to talk about Survivor, Carlton. We're talk- here to talk about you. So let's get back to the stuff. It's our conversation. All right. So when did you get interested in music and how did that passion evolve into the desire to pursue a career in the recording industry? Um, I always just loved music when I was a kid. Both of my parents are kind of amateur musicians. So there's always like a lot of guitars and keyboards and stuff like that around the house. So I kind of... I've always been, you know, even my parents got me a little baby guitar when I was, you know, three or four. And I'd just be like, learn one chord and run around the house playing the same stupid chord all the time. So I always had like a just kind of real interest in it, even from an early age. And then uh, probably really started to kind of get into guitar in my teenage years and started writing my own songs and playing in little punk bands when I was in junior high and high school and stuff like that. And, uh, yeah, but never really thought of it as, you know, something that I could make a career of. It was just something I loved to do. And, and uh, yeah, just over the years, you know, one thing kind of leads to the next. And, you know, here I am at a Super 8 in New Mexico talking to you. So Awesome. So could you describe the, mus- the musicians, producers, and recording artists that influenced your sound? Uh, sure. I mean... Growing up, there was a lot of kind of like rock music, you know, like as a teenager, everything, you know, we talked about the Crash Test Dummies. Um, I used to love like Metallica and Guns N' Roses and all that kind of stuff when I was in my teenage years. And then uh, kind of once I discovered like Bruce Springsteen and Bob Dylan, once I started writing songs kind of later, like getting close to 20, 
that really kind of opened my mind to like, oh yeah, songwriting. Uh, just got really obsessed with with writing songs and lyrics, and uh, so I'd say they were probably the two biggest influences as far as uh, you know influencing my craft of what I'm still trying to be better at now. You know, awesome. Like I know you mentioned Bruce Springsteen. My family is a Springsteen fan. My dad is a super fan. Awesome. Bruce Springsteen, and we did see him live in Kansas City back in 2016 for the River Tour. Oh, that's cool. It is probably one of the best experiences I have. It's like the Church of Rock and Roll. Yeah, I, I haven't got the chance to see him live yet, but I've watched so many concerts, and I love the uh, spring scene on Broadway. That, that you know, thing that was on Netflix and the album, I, I think I watched that like five or six times. I just thought it was so great where he's just up there by himself and telling the stories and the whole kind of one man show I found like really inspiring. You know, I'm out here with just my acoustic guitar too. So I'm trying to, you know, incorporate some, some stories and jokes and not just, you know, sing my stupid songs every night. So. I think Springsteen on Broadway was the one I lived in New York and for like for the past four or four years and Springsteen on Broadway was the one that got away. I really wish I was able to take my dad to that. Yeah. I think it was really hard to get tickets. I think right for, it was, I remember looking into it with my sister because she also loves Bruce Springsteen and we have friends in New York that we love to go visit any chance we can. But yeah, it was like the tickets were so expensive and you couldn't get them. We're like, okay, we'll just wait till it comes out on Netflix. So <laughs> It's just like the Hamilton and Disney Plus. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right, so Carlton, what have been some of the challenges that you faced breaking into the North American music industry and how did that, and how did you overcome those obstacles? Hmm, that's a good question. Um, well, I think just the music business in general is one of the harder businesses to kind of make your name in. Um, and I think it's just, you know, there's lots of really talented people that want to do this. Um, you know, people way more talented than me. I think it's a lot of like being tenacious in your work ethic and just kind of having a kind of never never quit attitude you know if it's something you really want to do and you believe in yourself and you work hard at your craft and you're just trying to get better and, and, and yeah and do all the things you need to do whether that's like touring getting better at writing songs you know late nights long drives all that stuff you just kind of got to be ready for for everything um to kind of even have a shot of making it so just always try to kind of work hard and and try to get better all the time at what I do, so. That's awesome to hear. So I would love to talk to you about some, about some of your songs, if you don't mind. Sure, let's go. And the stories behind them. So could you please tell me the story of before, uh, Pick Me Up, Dust Me Off. It's your most streamed song of Spotify with over 237,000 streams as of this recording. Yes. Um, that song I wrote it was a long time ago. That was like um, probably around 2011 or 2012. I wrote that with um, my friend Emily. So she was a uh, she lived in Toronto then. She's one of my best friends, collaborators, still is to this day. Uh, she lives in Nashville now. But um, yeah, I remember we were writing together one day, and we just uh, kind of kicked around a bunch of ideas during the afternoon. Sometimes when you're writing with your friends. Um, that you just want to hang out with anyway. You're just, you're not necessarily like trying to force a song out. You're just kind of hanging out and trying different ideas. And I remember her, um, her dad was really sick at the time and he ended up passing away not too long after this. He had like a kind of second bout of cancer. Oh, wow. And um, yeah, so that was, you know, that was on our mind. She was telling me about that. It was like a real heavy thing with her family. And uh, he, he, he was pretty young actually. He was in his 50s. Wow. But we started kind of kicking this idea around I started a little guitar thing of like what would if you're kind of at that point at the end of your life and you know uh you, you know you're leaving behind your grown-up children and and your grandchildren and stuff like that like what what would you want to say to them what would you want to pass on to them so that was kind of like the initial seed of that idea came from like a very real place and then we just kind of just dug into that idea and, and kind of put ourselves in his shoes a little bit and, and 
yeah, I, th I think it turned out, I'm still playing, that's the only old song that I'm playing at all my shows right now, and it just still kind of has an emotional impact on people every night, even though no one really knows that story, I just play the song, and, um, but yeah, it's, it definitely came from like a real emotional place, and I think that's why it's resonated with people, you know, I hope. <laughs> It has resonated with people, and I'm very interested, and I'm, I'm surprised to learn that you haven't shared that story, because the thing is, I think you would very, it would not only tug at the heart, it's the song tugs at the heartstrings, but if people learn that story, I'm like, oh, it's a wake up, it's like a, uh, it's an aha moment. Mm. Yeah, that's a good point. Maybe I should share that on stage. I always felt like, um, you know, me and Emily wrote the song, but we were really trying to express, like, her emotions, her, her dad's story. So I never really like felt comfortable kind of like telling her story in a microphone on stage, but then I can tell you obviously like where it came from. But, um, but yeah, maybe you're right. Maybe I should tell people that more. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm glad I heard that something out of this podcast, out of my podcast can help. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay. So while we're on the subject of family, blood is thicker than water. Oh, yeah. So that I wrote with uh, another one of my great friends, Mo Kenny. Um, we did a little weekend of songwriting one time, just like there was five or six songwriters just at this cabin in New Brunswick. And uh, yeah, so we would just write two songs a day. We were kind of switching up the groups. And that was the last song of the weekend. And I don't know if you're familiar with Mo Kenny. Uh, they're an amazing singer, songwriter, artist. But uh We've written a lot of songs over the years, and they have kind of a, a, a weird brain like I do. Like, we never want to write about, like, a love song, or we never want to write about something. We always want to write about something creepy or weird. So we had this idea at the time. We were just like, oh, what if me and you were, like, brother and sister, and our parents uh, grounded us, and we weren't happy about it, so we killed them. So that was, it was just a very, <laughs> just a made up story that we were just doing for fun that day and never really thought, you know, when you write a song, you don't know how people, if anyone's going to hear it ever. So you're just writing it for fun. We're just like laughing, writing this song about murdering our imaginary parents. <laughs> aye, aye, aye. My, and, uh, I gotta say, for those of you who are listening to this on audio, my jaw just dropped. <laughs> Yeah, so again, I used to tell that story on stage. I haven't played that song in a while, so I don't tell I got to say, um, avoid that story if possible, yeah. because I don't want you to get, like, the what the hell. <laughs> it, you know, it's like people make up movies all the time. It's the same thing. You can just make up a story and write a song about it. We just thought it was funny. It made us laugh. And then I remember, like, that was the last song of the weekend. A couple hours later, we're, like, just having a beer, and we listen back, and we're like, ooh, we think this one's actually pretty good like this might have some legs and then obviously recorded it and sang it at shows for years so yeah anyway but that's that's the story behind that one so all righty um before we got on our call i was actually listening to paper cup and one line that came out of me when i was listening to that song it's like if bob dylan was singing under a classic john marriage song like why georgia why your body is your wonderland or yeah. something like or waiting on the world to change those kind of guitar vibes oh cool thanks um i wrote that one with mo as well actually and uh again that was another thing we made up uh do you remember the uh the movie office space you remember that movie where it's like the yeah guy... yeah i've heard of it but like the only office thing that i know is the office Okay. Well, anyway, the Office Space movie, I think it's, it was uh, Mike Judd, who, who was the director, writer, who did like Beavis and Butthead and a bunch of other funny things. But it's a very funny movie, but it's just basically kind of showing the, the drabness of this guy that's going into the office every day and he hates his life and he's stuck in rush hour traffic to in his commute every day. And it's just like kind of poking fun at that. And that was kind of where like I just got back from L.A., and uh which i've been to a bunch of times but this particular time we were working at a studio it was like five minutes from our airbnb and we would like start at 11 a.m and we would get there we'd be at the studio in five minutes and then when we would finish at six o'clock or whatever it would take us an hour to drive the same five minutes back 
because the traffic was so crazy. And I was just thinking, oh, I can't believe people live like this. Like it's so, so much of your life is just spent in commute. So I remember coming into the writing session that day and talking to Mo about that. And we were like, let's write a song about that. So it was kind of like our, our song version of uh, Office Space. <laughs> so Interesting. Yeah. But you should check out that movie. It's actually really funny. I'll do my best. Okay, so one of your old, last of stuff of your old material before we talk about your new single is Monte Carlo. And when I was listening to that, that saxophone player, I got to give him them props because that reminded me so much of Clarence Clements. I love that guy. I only, uh, I met him the one day in the studio. Um, we recorded the whole, all the bed tracks in Toronto in November, I think it was. And so, yeah, I was in the studio all week with all the, all the musicians, like drummer, bass, keys, guitar, me, we, you know, like made all the songs all week. And then on the weekend, I went to another studio with another great pedal steel producer, uh, Aaron Goldstein. And he had, he's like, oh yeah, I, I was like, I need saxophone, I need trumpet. He's like, I know the saxophone guy. <laughs> it's like, so the guy, is, his name's Julian uh, Nolly, N-A-I-L-I or something like that. And he was incredible. And I think he played on three or four songs and he just came in. He's like, what do you want me to do on this one? I was just like, just rip it, dude. Like Saturday Night Live vibes, <laughs> just like whatever you want. Just gave him three or four passes at the solo. And I was like, yeah, the second one was great. Perfect. Song's done. <laughs> Next, you know. Um, but yeah, I love saxophone. And I produced this upcoming record myself. So there was no one telling me it was a bad idea to put saxophone all over it. So I just did what I wanted. That's good. So speaking of upcoming record, let's talk about one of those songs that are going to be on that record. House in the Hills was written yes. in early 2020 before our world turned upside down. So yeah. how was this song similar or different to other tunes that you wrote or produced in the past? Hmm. Um, well, yeah, this just making this whole record in general is the first time since the very beginning of my career that I was producing my own stuff. I always wanted to hire an outside producer just to learn and, and make sure I had like, I wasn't as experienced in the studio, you know, for those records. So, um, yeah, it, it was just, the song was, uh, again, like you never know when you write a song, if anyone's going to hear it. So you're just kind of, writing it for yourself and who you're writing with. And then that one in particular, I remember I took it back to Nova Scotia after I did the bed tracks with the band in Toronto and I was finishing songs first. And that was kind of one of the ones I left till the end. And I was like, I'm not really sure what to do with this one yet. I was just kind of like putting it off. And then uh, a really great friend of mine, amazing producer, songwriter, uh, Aaron Costello, she came down for like the weekend at this house I was working out of. And she, I had made a little beat. I was like, oh, I think I'm going to take the drums out. I'm going to make this little beat instead. And she's like, oh, you should do a guitar like this. And then she's like, I'd love to sing on this. I was like, oh, my God, I'd love for you to sing on this. So then me and her kind of like worked on it together. And yeah, it's just, it, it's a little different than uh, a, a, all the other ones on the record just because, of, you know, it was just like, okay, let's turn these drums down. Let's add a beat. Let's, you know. Just kind of doing something different here, sorry. Um, so yeah, I don't know if that answers the question properly, but it sure does. So let's okay. get started. About let's talk about who are your dream collaborators: the singers, the songwriters, the producers, and the musicians that you, that you want to record with, and how would they enhance your sound quality? Mm, that's interesting. Um, well, I know as far as a songwriter goes, I have like a dream wish list of people that I would love to write with more for their projects than for me. But like, uh, I would say like the killers are one of my favorite bands in the world. I've just loved them forever. And, uh, if there was kind of like a bucket list band that I could like get in a room with and work with, I'd be like, Oh, I love the killers. Um, yeah, I don't know. And then besides that, like, I feel like the crew of humans that I write with, I'm pretty happy with, you know, I feel like everyone, uh, 
there's no kind of special sauce for success in the music business. It's more of just like find your crew of people and, and do great work together. Um, trying to think like someone like Ryan Tedder, you know, he's a, I love him as a songwriter, you know, um, Lewis Bell, he works on all Post Malone stuff. I'm a big fan of his productions and writing. Um, I've been trying to get them on my podcast for years, and same with Andrew Watts. Oh, yes. Him, too. Love all his work. Um, like, his, the- especially his, uh, his, his collaborations with Elton John, especially Ordinary Man with Ozzy Osbourne and Stevie Nicks, Fat Stolen Car. Oh, my God. Those are epic. I know. I love all the the newest Miley Cyrus record that he did too. Andrew, Watt, I was obsessed with that. He did um, a wonderful job with Miley, and I gotta say, I think Miley found the right producer for her. Yeah, that seemed to really work. He worked on this Justin Bieber song too that I was so obsessed with, the uh, Anyone song. I don't oh, know yeah. if you know the song, but yeah, Andrew Watt did that. And, Chad Smith from the Red Hot Chili Peppers plays drums on it, and it's just turning out so good. Probably my and not to mention the fact. Here's the crazy part of it: he yeah. also produced Miley's "Nothing Else Matters" that had Elton John on piano, Chad Smith on drums, Yo Yo Ma on cello. I know. I was talking about that today because we were driving through New Mexico, and I'm seeing like the video. It's all on, you know. It's all around that area. I'm like, oh, this is like the Miley Cyrus. Nothing else matters video, like what I'm seeing right now, which was uh, great. Um, I, yeah, I just remember my probably a top songwriter I'd love to work with is Tobias Jesso Jr. Don't know if you know him. He's a Canadian guy, L A based now, um, but ha- you know co-writes with Adele. He co-wrote the boyfriend song on the new Harry Styles album, which I love that song, um, and a bunch of other things. So. Maybe someday. I, I'll guess, I hope so, because I got to say, I would love to see you and Andrew Watt together, because I got to say, Andrew Watt is our generation's Max Martin. Yeah, that's true. Max Martin, obviously. I, I'd do anything to work with Max Martin, even just be a fly on the wall to watch him work for a day on someone else's music. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. I told people all the time, if there was a... If, if I only had three base songwriters that I could choose that besides that are artists who perform their own music, I would choose Desmond Child, who I'm very grateful and blessed to have him on this podcast before, Amazing. Max Martin, and the one and only Diane Warren. Yes. Oh, Diane Warren's getting in some trouble because she <laughs> tweeted about Beyonce. I, I have that. to side with Miss Warren because, you know, honestly, 24 people on the song. Hey, I like from a co-writing perspective and then you start sampling things. So if you sample something, there's three or four writers on that song. They're writers. You sample another little piece. There's three or four writers on that. I would doubt there's ever, there was never 24 people in the room, but I get what she's saying. You know what I mean? But she's someone who writes all her songs by herself. So she's very like, not a lot of famous people do that anymore, you know? And still, Diane Warren's song still tests and tests of time. I can, I don't want to miss a thing because you love me. I didn't know my own strength. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Huge fan. Huge fan. All righty. So we got to start winding down our interviews because I think it's tell it because I think we could talk about songwriting all day. Yeah, I think we could. Yes, for sure. All right. So here's the third and last question. So yeah. what are your favorite social media? Uh, your favorite social media platforms? Uh, I feel like I just, uh, I, I'm more put up with social media than really love it, but uh, it's a necessary part of our business. But I'd say Instagram is the one that I feel most comfortable on. I still haven't done the TikTok mm-hmm. thing. I'm like, I'm probably too old for that, but maybe I'll have to soon. Um, as far as what I like, consuming as just like a user i think i like twitter the most just because i like short little you know i'm a word guy i like little jokes and stuff like that so like just as far as like sitting there scrolling i like twitter but as far as what i'm good at posting probably instagram question mark so i gotta say i cannot do tiktok for the life of me i will not do tiktok because i'm scared (laughs) about going down a rabbit hole 
and yeah. I'm already one of the most, and I'm pretty busy, so <laughs> I would lose a lot of productivity if I yeah. was down that rabbit hole. <laughs> yeah, me too. All right, Carlton, so here is one of the last questions. So if okay. you had a chance to meet with a, a writer, a songwriter, singer, musician, or a band that wants to work with you, what advice do you share with them before you take them into the studio? Hmm, that's a good question. Um, I think just kind of be yourself and try to try to be comfortable. Like the best music and songwriting comes from a place of vulnerability. So like if you come in and you kind of have your walls up, you know, the best sessions always start with, having a conversation of like what's going on in your life, you know, and it's usually sometimes it's people you haven't met before you end up talking about really deep emotional things or whatever. Um, so yeah, just like try to be comfortable, be yourself. You don't have to like put on any mask or front. It's just like music is about communication. Um, so yeah, I think that's the best thing. And ego, having an ego coming into a songwriting session is always, that's kind of the, the devil of songwriting it's like when once you start letting your ego get in the way then it's like oh you're you're kind of screwed a bit so i think that's some advice i don't know <laughs> okay some really good advice so carl I'm ready for the last question i'm ready okay where can my audience find you on social media that's one where can they consume your music that's number two and number three if you're still on tour where can they find tickets for you to see you before. Okay. So first question, all like Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, all those things. I'm active on all those three pretty much every day, especially when I'm on tour right now. Um, all my music can be found on Spotify, Apple Music, YouTube, Amazon, all the places that you would find music. And then as far as tickets and shows, you can go to my website, carltonstone.com. All the info is there for all the shows and ticket links for everyone. We're heading to Colorado tomorrow, then back down New Mexico, Arizona, California, up the West Coast. So yeah, there's lots of shows coming up. So if they want to check them out, you can go there. I know you mentioned Colorado. Are you planning a Boulder visit? Oh, I don't think so. I think we're pretty, pretty tight for time. <laughs> we're going, we're going to Denver tomorrow, and then I think we have to drive back down to uh, Santa Fe the next day. So it's not a lot of time for sightseeing on this run. But you know, I know, I know. But next time you, I'm a Boulder alumni. You need to go see that in me. It's an amazing town. Okay, you're actually the second person today that's talked to me about Boulder when I told them I was going to Colorado. So uh, I know, I know it's true now, confirmed. So awesome. I'm glad to hear it. So guys, if you missed an episode of the Jake's Take with Jacob Elliott Sharp podcast, visit our channels on Apple Podcasts, Deezer, Google Podcasts, Podcast Addicts, Spotify, and Spreaker. It's Jake's Take with Jacob Elliott Sharp, J-A-C-O-B-E-L-Y-A-C-H-A-R. Are you on social media? Because I'm on social media too. Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube, Jacob Elliott Sharp, J-A-C-O-B-E-L-Y-A-C-H-A-R. And Carlton, jakestake.com the blog that started all is turning is turning 11 this year congratulations man that's a that's a commitment <laughs> it is it is so if you guys want to check out the articles my music reviews and reviews i read including my conversation with willie Swat stratton head over there carlton you were incredible i truly enjoyed talking with you about survivor and bruce springsteen and <laughs> and our affiliation with andrew watts <laughs> yes awesome thank you so much jake man it's been a pleasure all right guys thank you so much for listening thank you so much for watching until next time have a great one everybody